Wake up! Do you have any idea how disheartening it is to spend days or even weeks preparing these lessons just for you to sleep through them? You could at least do me the courtesy of turning off your webcam, Alex. I know this year has been tough. We're all stressed out and nobody likes these Zoom classes, especially not me. But we only have a week left before finals. Most of you are seniors and have already been accepted into college. I get it. You don't care about US history to 1865 anymore. But this isn't just US history, it's honors US history. You guys are supposed to be the best of the best, and right now, you're behaving worse than my mainstream kids. Hot mics, sleeping, playing on your Put it away, Patrick! I can see you! Since you've all been labeled as gifted, you take your education for granted. You've been told your whole life that you're special and better than everyone else. You may not realize it yet, but you've been handed literally everything. All obstacles have been cleared from your path, and you think things are just naturally easy, which I suppose makes sense. You've only ever experienced experience school from your own privileged perspective. It wasn't always this good, and for most people, it still isn't. The plan for the rest of the week was to talk about reconstruction, but since you clearly aren't into that, I guess I need to come up with something else. Perhaps it's time you learn what education is really like in America. This video is brought to you by Curiosity Stream and Nebula. Alright, is everybody here? I expect you all to take copious notes. Even though this won't be on the final, it will be on a separate quiz, which you'll take at the same time. Yes, you will have time to complete them both, Sam. Before we get started, make sure you're all muted. This isn't a discussion. Save your questions for the end. Let me just turn on a filter real quick. All right. When America was first founded, most schoolhouses had a single room with a single teacher supervising dozens of kids of all ages. It was just as chaotic as you imagine, with five-year-olds and 15-year-olds doing different things at the same time. If a school was lucky enough to have textbooks, they were outdated British ones that didn't follow any sort of established curriculum. If we were going to be a new independent country, we needed new independent textbooks. So in 1783, Noah Webster published the Blue backed speller, introducing American English to the world. He took the U out of color and flavor and spelled words like defense and center correctly for the first time. It was organized by difficulty, starting with the alphabet, then basic sounds and syllables, and finally full words. Both 5 and 15 year olds could learn how to spell using the same book. This was the first real American textbook and could be found in every classroom for the next hundred years. But not everyone could send their kids to school. It was a privilege for the rich, since most families had to use their children as little workers. That was until Horace Mann came along, the father of American public education. Borrowing from the Prussian model, he established a network of common schools in Massachusetts in 1840, which provided free education to everyone who wanted it, as long as they were white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, otherwise known as WASPs. You have to remember that America was founded by a bunch of religious conservatives who broke away from the Church of England, which itself had broken away from the Catholic Church. So Americans doubly hated Catholics. Catholics. By the late 1840s, the Irish potato famine was in full swing, and a large portion of the Irish Catholics fleeing the country came to the United States, where conditions weren't much better for them. Anti-immigrant violence and discrimination were rampant in the big cities. Irish people were viewed as a degenerate race separate from white people. Unlike the American wasps, they swore allegiance to a pope on the other side of the world. American common schools were meant to provide us with a unified common culture, so just about every school followed a Protestant curriculum. They read from the King James Bible and often sang Protestant hymns. John Hughes, the Archbishop of New York, wasn't happy that Catholic taxes were being used to fund a school system that taught a different religious culture. Catholic children were being indoctrinated into Protestantism, so he established the first Catholic parochial school in 1850, a private school which provided a traditional education alongside a religious one. In 1884, the church decided that every parish in the country would be required to have a school. This was the beginning of private schools in America, where parents pay a tuition separate from their taxes in order to send their children to a special school. Currently, 10.1% of all students nationwide are in private schools. Tuition can range from $9,400 a year for a Catholic school to $25,700 a year for a non-religious school. 
if you can find one. Just over three quarters of all private schools are religious in nature. The Catholic private school system is the largest in the country. Just over a third of all private school students go to a Catholic school, and 17% of them aren't even Catholic. Around the same time, Americans were manifesting their destiny all over the West, creating new railroad towns and mining camps in their wake. The Oregon Trail was at its busiest in 1852. That same year, Catherine Beecher created the American Women's Educational Association with the goal of training women to be teachers so they could civilize the West. She wanted to create a profession for women that had the same prestige as doctors and lawyers do for men. Pretty quickly, states began hiring female teachers. While their natural caretaking abilities were occasionally brought up, in the end, it always came down to money. God seems to have made women peculiarly suited to guide and develop the infant mind, and it seems very poor policy to pay a man $20 or $22 a month for teaching children the ABCs, when a female could do the work more successfully at one-third of the price. Civilizing the West eventually included creating a number of Indian boarding schools with the express purpose of killing the Indian to save the man, meaning they would be stripped of their own culture in favor of an American one. They were taught English, Protestant Christian values, and vocational skills for future industrial jobs. By the 1880s, there were dozens of these schools all over the country. By the end of the Civil War, every state had guaranteed public education as a right, and primarily hired female teachers. Education is not a federal right. It's not in the Constitution. It's one of the few things we leave to the states, which more often than not means they're going to try and maintain the status quo. If black people people can't be enslaved anymore, they can still be made into second-class citizens. In the 1870s, Reconstruction ended and Jim Crow began. I know, we're actually going to talk about what happened after the Civil War for once. Strange how we never seem to have time for that. Almost like they want to keep this stuff a secret. Segregation became a de facto national policy after the 1896 Plessy v. Ferguson decision. The Supreme Court stated that providing separate but equal facilities did not violate the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. It's important to note that this didn't start segregation, it was already happening. Privately owned businesses all had separate entrances and seating areas for white and black people. And if you didn't like it, you didn't have to shop there. But voting with your wallet isn't really a thing, and it especially doesn't work when the government is also participating in the thing you're trying to stop. Segregation was in the military, public transportation, and most importantly for us, schools. White people had no problem pooling their taxes together to fund a school in their neighborhood, but they didn't want any of their tax dollars going to other neighborhoods. If black people wanted schools, they should have to pool their taxes together in order to fund them, if only they had any property to pay taxes on. After the Civil War, the federal government was more than happy to give away free land to white people under the Homestead Act. The recently freed slaves weren't given anything to start with. So as you can imagine, the white schools were well funded with state and local tax dollars, while the black schools were left to fend for themselves, or rely on private charity with questionable motivations. In 1902, John D. Rockefeller founded the General Education Board, which established a number of schools in the South specifically for black people, though the reasons were anything but benevolent. Here are some of the things that a leader of the board wanted black students to know. Learn that any work, however menial, if done well, is dignified. Learn that the world will give full credit for labor and success, even though the skin is black. Learn that it is a mistake to be educated out of your necessary environment. Know that it is a crime for any teacher, white or black, to educate the Negro for positions which are not open to him. Know that the greatest opportunity for a successful life lies in the Southland where you were born, where the people know you and need you, and will treat you far better than in any other section of the country. These schools were set up to teach black students in the South two things. Firstly, agricultural and vocational skills that they would need to do their job, and nothing more. And secondly, please stay in the South. Don't move to our cities. You're fine here. The second part of that plan didn't work, and the mass migration of black people to cities like Detroit, Chicago, and Milwaukee will cause all sorts of issues we'll discuss later this week. But segregation didn't only apply to black people. Mexican students in the Southwest, Chinese students on the West Coast, and Indian students in boarding schools all faced similar issues. They were separated and only given a vocational education. At this point in history, schools taught in whatever language was most common in that neighborhood, which wasn't always English. The United States does not have an official language, so it was fairly common to find schools which operated entirely in Chinese, or Spanish, or even German in the Midwest. 
right up until World War I anyway. Our patriotic distrust of the Germans specifically led every school in the country to switch to English only, while foreign languages took a back seat if they were taught at all. But even at this point in history, only about a third of school-aged children were actually going to school. It was still an optional luxury. If you ask kids on the street whether they'd rather be learning in a school or working in a factory, 80% of them would choose the factory. They needed to earn an income for their family. That was until the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938, which established a 40-hour work week, a minimum wage, and banned most forms of child labor, especially in manufacturing. Suddenly, all of these unemployed children needed a place to go. As you've probably guessed, that place was school, but since we're almost out of time for today, we'll pick up here tomorrow. I'll be answering questions in the chat for the next few minutes, but otherwise have a good rest of your day. All right, everyone, I hope you're having a good morning. Just a few quick announcements before we get started. If you ordered any Golden Fork certificates, those should be in your mailbox. Otherwise, contact Mr. Morgan. And permission slips for Sunday's watch party are due no later than Friday. I had a lot of comments about the audio during the last class, so don't worry, I won't be using that same filter again. But same deal as last time, make sure you're all muted. All right, so a quick recap. Yesterday, we covered the birth of public education thanks to Horace Mann and his common schools. Then we talked about the Catholics, splitting off to start private schools. We talked about how westward expansion created a demand for new teachers, which were primarily women, since they were cheaper than hiring men. We talked about how racial segregation was the norm from the beginning. Plessy v. Ferguson simply allowed it to continue with a federal thumbs up. We talked about Rockefeller's plan to teach black people vocational skills only. And we finished up by talking about why every school speaks English and why every child is in a classroom rather than a factory. If you missed any of that or need a refresher, the recording is in the class notes below. Up until the turn of the century, education was focused on the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Yes, I know they don't all start with the letter R. That was the joke. This is typically known as a traditional education, as opposed to a progressive one where you learn by doing, either by building things or going on field trips. Progressive education was first thought up in 1899 by John Dewey, and ever since then, education has been on a pendulum swinging between the two extremes. But as with most things, you need a mix. In 1907, the Gary Plan was introduced at a high school in Indiana, and this eventually became the model for every school in the country. You are currently learning under the Gary Plan. This is where you physically change classrooms, teachers, and subjects every hour or so, usually to the sound of a bell. Where's that coming from? The bell usually makes people think that schools are just places to train future factory workers, but that's actually not true. In the beginning, most schools were housed in churches, which rang their bells every hour. People were pretty used to telling time by a bell, and at this point in history, most children were still in factories, so there was no need to train them for a future factory job. So in 1920, a principal from Stanford University named Elwood P. Coverley introduced the idea of career or oriented academic tracking, tailoring your education to your future job. The idea was borrowed from the military. During World War I, soldiers drafted into the army were given a test to figure out what their position would be, whether that's in the infantry or the signal corps. It was known as the Group Examination Alpha, a predecessor to the modern ASVAB, and included questions like, garnets are usually yellow, blue, green, or red, alfalfa is a kind of hay, corn, fruit, or rice, and McDowell is famous as a, what? This is supposed to determine what job I'm gonna have in the military? After the war was over, a few people thought, why don't we do that for everybody? Why don't we figure out what job someone will have and then give them that specific education rather than give them a general education and let them decide what to do with their lives? This idea of putting a sorting hat on everyone to determine their future career was a spin-off of the eugenics movement, which was closely tied to scientific racism. People were obsessed with using science to categorize and rank people, especially by race and intelligence. It started with measuring skulls to calculate brain volume. Then it moved on to academic tests like the Army Alpha, which purported to measure your innate genetic intelligence, and using that measurement, we can determine what future career you should have. It all sounds pretty dystopian, right? But this is the basis for all modern standardized tests, including the Scholastic Aptitude Test, or SAT, and its main competitor, the ACT, the two main college entrance exams in the US. While the questions no longer ask about famous composers or brand slogans, they still rely on word recognition and previous exposure 
exposure to the content, especially math. They aren't measuring some immutable characteristic, but that's exactly what they claim. They market their tests as a way for colleges to predict how well you will do at their school. It's an aptitude test, not a test of general knowledge. If I spend a year teaching you history and then give you a test on how much history you know, that's a knowledge test. I'm testing how much you've learned during the course. Most other countries have some sort of final knowledge test at the end of your required schooling like the GCSE in the UK, and you get a grade based on your performance. Our tests work a little differently. While they still give you a bunch of word associations and math problems, your score isn't based on how much you know. It's a score which rates your college preparedness. This is known as projective testing. Your SAT and ACT scores are supposed to be relatively stable and unchangeable, just like the IQ tests they're based on. But we all know that isn't true, right? The mere fact that getting private tutoring at a test prep center or just taking the test multiple times will dramatically increase your score proves that it's not measuring anything innate. It's just a knowledge test like any other. Here's a question from the first edition of the SAT in 1926. Three of the following words are related to each other in some definite way. Which three words are most closely related? Columbus, Socrates, Beethoven, Wagner, Verdi, Corneille. There is very little difference between this question and Wagner is famous as a blank. If you don't know who Wagner is, or the fact that it's pronounced Wagner, that is not a reflection on your unchanging genetic intelligence. It's a reflection on how much you paid attention to obscure facts in school. It's measuring your familiarity with words and concepts that a bunch of white eugenicists thought were important enough to include in a college entrance exam, specifically so they could sort you into one of three main academic tracks. There were the college-bound students, who were given a broad education to prepare them for university, almost exclusively for white students. There was the vocational track, which prepared students for menial day laborer jobs in the fields and factories. Following in Rockefeller's footsteps, this is what most minority students received. As the country industrialized, this would be expanded to include clerical work and most white-collar office jobs, especially once women started working. But then there was the home economics track, for women who were destined to be housewives so they could learn how to garden and cook. This was actually born out of the temperance movement against alcohol. It was thought that if housewives knew how to prepare a good meal, husbands wouldn't stop at the saloon to get drunk on their way home from work. Because, you know, dinner's waiting. Some women were allowed into the college track if they tested well enough and were going to become teachers or nurses. But at this point, there were virtually no minority students going to college. While these tests were technically available to anyone, discrimination and social pressure kept people in whatever path was chosen for them. Students were being given a different different curriculum based on who they were. But after World War II, there was one class that everyone had in common, known as Life Adjustment Education, part of the progressive movement against traditional education. This is the kind of class that you all say you wish existed. It taught practical life skills like how to pay your taxes, choose a dentist, drive a car, or even how to ask that pretty girl you're sweet on to go steady. It was a general life skills class. Built on Horace Mann's common school idea, this was meant to give us all a common culture and shared etiquette. Unfortunately, this is also where a lot of that classic baby boomer brainwashing took place. A lot of what were called social guidance films were distributed to high schools around the country to teach students everything from how to plan a party, to how to protect yourself against a nuclear explosion, to how to avoid catching diseases. What Jimmy didn't know was that Ralph was sick, a sickness that was not visible like smallpox, but no less dangerous and contagious, a sickness of the mind. You see, Ralph was a homosexual. Soon, the government and various corporations realized that these school videos could help spread the virtues of capitalism and the evils of collectivization and unions. Blind patriotism began sneaking into education. We didn't start saying the Pledge of Allegiance in school until 1942. After Sputnik was launched by the Soviet Union, the National Defense Education Act of 1958 put a renewed emphasis on math and science, swinging the pendulum back towards a traditional education. Throughout the entire history, of public education in America, there have been several attempts to establish a national curriculum, the most successful of which was Core Knowledge in 1986. I don't know how to describe this curriculum except to say that if you're a Gen Xer or a Millennial, which none of you are, this is almost guaranteed to be what you were taught in school. You just didn't know it was called Core Knowledge. The main criticisms were that it presented a very Eurocentric, pro-American view of history and placed too much emphasis on the memorization of facts. 
rather than developing creativity or critical thinking skills. The defense being that before we can teach you how to think, we first have to give you something to think about. This is the traditional versus progressive debate. In the last decade, core knowledge has been fading away in favor of its replacement, Common Core, introduced in 2010, which focuses more on the process rather than the answer. I guess my main point is you can tell your parents to stop freaking out about a government takeover of education. We've always had some sort of national curriculum, and we're getting closer to the right mixture of content and creativity. Oh, I'm way over. I'm sorry I wasn't paying attention. We have a lot of heavy stuff to cover tomorrow, so show up bright and early with an open mind. Are you guys getting anything out of this, or am I just wasting? You know what? Just go to your next class, and I'll catch up with a few of you later. All right, everyone, I hope you're all settled in because we have a lot to get through today. Make sure you're all muted and hold your questions for the end. Looks like there's quite a few of you watching live today. You must be excited to get to some modern history or my super engaging teaching methods. Just a quick recap for those of you who are on your phone during the important parts. On Tuesday, we talked about the creation of common schools and the beginning of private schools, why teachers are predominantly women and how segregation became the norm. Remember, Plessy v. Ferguson didn't start it, it was already happening. Yesterday, we talked about the battle between traditional and progressive education and how that shaped the schedule and curriculum in school, as well as academic tracking and standardized tests. As usual, these concepts are gonna come up again today, so if you missed anything or need a refresher, the links to previous recordings are down in the class notes. We're starting with the most important case in the history of education. The Brown v. Board decision in 1954, which was actually five different cases wrapped up into one, stated that segregated facilities were inherently unequal, and that states should desegregate with all deliberate speed, and we all lived happily ever after. I'm kidding, of course, the decision was incredibly unpopular. In 1957, the governor of Arkansas sent the National Guard to prevent nine black students from attending Little Rock Central High School. Eisenhower had to send federal troops to end the standoff. Each black student had an armed paratrooper escort for the entire school year, though they were still harassed and beaten pretty regularly. A year after that, the governor simply closed every high school in Little Rock rather than allow integration, and he was far from the only one to do so. Entire districts were closed in Virginia for up to five years, but the white students still needed an education, and with all of the public schools being closed, where were they supposed to go? Almost immediately after Brown v. Board, there was a dramatic increase in private schools in the South. This decision only applied to public schools, and aside from sending federal troops to escort every integrated student, it didn't include any practical enforcement mechanism or deadlines. There was no punishment for failing to decide Segregate. So all of the white students in the South were sent to what came to be known as segregation academies. They weren't even trying to hide their purpose. These were private schools which received public funds based on attendance. They sprang up as part of so-called freedom of choice plans, started by white parents who were against sending their children to integrated schools. Many students received tuition grants from the state to pay for them. Since they were private schools, they didn't fall under the Brown v. Board decision, so they could get away with only accepting white students students, who again did not have to pay anything out of pocket. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 was supposed to provide some teeth to desegregation by banning racial discrimination in any federally funded program, but that only affected public schools which received federal funds. It took until 1976 for the Supreme Court to decide that private schools couldn't discriminate based on race either, so they just found other ways to discriminate, like test scores or income. Many of them continue to exist as private schools to this day day and flew the Confederate flag well into the 90s. According to the most recent census data, the school-aged population of the United States is 50.2% white just over half. But private school enrollment is 66.7% white, mostly due to the fact that 43% of all private schools are classified as virtually all white, meaning that over 90% of their student population is white. They may no longer be called segregation academies, but that's exactly what they are. In 1965, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, or ESEA, was passed, providing federal funding for public schools to train teachers and buy materials. It even provided extra funding for schools in impoverished areas. This was necessary because of the way we primarily fund education in this country. It's not from state or federal taxes. It's from local property taxes. We've been doing it this way since the Civil War, but in 1973, the San Antonio v. Rodriguez decision allowed this system 
system to continue. Like Plessy v. Ferguson, this was just a federal thumbs up. So if you lived in a rich neighborhood, your school was well funded. But if you lived in a public housing project in the middle of a city, this particular problem was especially bad in the North. The North and the South had two separate but equally difficult challenges when it came to integration. Rockefeller's plan to convince Black people to stay in the South failed. After Reconstruction ended, millions of Black people moved from the Jim Crow South to big cities in the North like Detroit, Chicago, and Milwaukee. When they arrived, all of the white people in the cities fled to the suburbs. This was known as white flight. Thanks to the GI Bill and a booming economy, the growing middle class was finally able to afford homes in newly constructed neighborhoods outside of the city. Many of these neighborhoods were designated for white people only. This was enforced through a combination of mob violence violence, police harassment, and banks refusing to give loans to black people. This is why we describe racism as institutional or systemic. School funding is linked to housing policy and property values, which are controlled by the banks, who look at poverty and crime rates, which involves law enforcement. They're all connected and interact with each other. In the North, we ended up with a situation where white people worked in the city, but they took their wealth to the suburbs, where they owned their homes and paid taxes. So those schools were pretty well funded. But the people of color who lived in the city either rented or lived in public housing, and property values were kept deliberately low by banks through redlining. So those schools were barely funded at all. The ESEA helped a little bit, but how do you integrate a community which has geographically segregated itself? The answer was by physically moving students between these neighborhoods. In practice, this meant inner city minority students were bussed out to the suburban schools. White students were never sent into the city. This policy began in 1971 and was immediately rebranded as forced busing by politicians who were against it, like Nixon and Reagan. And it subsequently became a popular right-wing dog whistle, a way to be racist without sounding racist. In 1974, the Supreme Court decided that busing could only take place within city limits. You could no longer bus students out to the suburbs, effectively ending the practice only a few years after it began. Most cities in the North never even bothered to begin busing in the first place, but those that did soon dropped the program. As a result, schools today are more racially segregated than they were before Brown v. Board. Segregation is no longer official government policy, but it continues through self-selection, either by going to a private school or moving to a homogenous neighborhood. This is known as de facto segregation. The problem with de facto segregation is that a lot of people quietly participate in it while outwardly expressing that they believe in integration, especially nice white parents. During the 60s, a lot of white parents wanted schools to be built between white and black neighborhoods, specifically so the school would be integrated and diverse. But then when it came time to send their kids to it, I remember thinking very clearly that, okay, I believe in this, but I don't sort of want to sacrifice my children to it. That's racial segregation, though. Up until this point in history, if a woman wanted to go to college, she pretty much had to be a teacher or a nurse. Most colleges barely accepted women at all. But in 1972, Title IX was passed, which did for gender what the Civil Rights Act did for race. You could no longer discriminate based on gender if you received federal funding. This opened up colleges and universities to women, but more relevant to people your age, it required schools to provide equitable opportunities for women in sports, and let women out of the housewife academic track. There's still a lot of social pressure for boys to take woodshop and girls to take home economics, but it's a lot easier to cross over. There is no legal distinction anymore. Around the same time, a Chinese student in San Francisco who only spoke Chinese was put into a mainstream classroom that only spoke English. Many students like him were simply failed for not understanding the material. The school argued that they provided an equal education to everyone and they were not responsible for the different starting points students were coming from. The Supreme Court disagreed. The 1974 Lau v. Nichols decision required every school in the country to provide English as a second language services to any student who needed it. This is the difference between equality and equity. This same situation would come up again a year later with disabled students. They all had equal access to the same building and education, but not equitable access. The Education for All Handicapped Children Act made it a federal requirement for schools to provide disability services for both physical and mental disabilities. This was the beginning of special education in America. While it existed on a small scale here and there, 
This made it so every school was required to have it. And that made people furious. To explain why, I need to show you a video from a very influential thought leader at the time. Just let me pull it up real quick. Oh, of course there's an unskippable ad. Okay, we'll sit through this together. Hey, do you like this video? Would you like to see more of it? Then you should head over to Nebula, where viewers have already seen two minutes of additional content, as well as seeing ad-free versions of all of my videos. Nebula is a streaming service built by fellow YouTube educators who wanted to work with an entirely different curriculum. Are you into podcasts? Nebula has those too, like Genesis, hosted by Alex the Low Spec Gamer, where different creators talk about their YouTube origin stories. Oh hey, I'm in one of these. Check it out by also signing up for Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and nonfiction titles, which you can access across multiple platforms. Want to know how schools could use technology to reinvent education? Check out the school episode of Dream the Future, a series which takes a look at a number of different industries. So head on over to curiositystream.com slash knowing better. For a limited time, you can get a deal on both Curiosity Stream and Nebula for only $14.79 a year. You'll also be supporting the channel when you do. Now, get back to class. The newest proposals of having special millions spent on subnormal children and on the handicapped is the attempt to bring everybody to the level of the handicap. And if it's merely an issue of physical handicap, like a broken leg, uh, which doesn't affect the mind, that would be a little more excusable. But it includes the mentally retarded, which is the subnormal, the children who are unable to learn. So that at the end of spending thousands or millions of taxpayers' money, uh, you're left with a half idiot who may learn to read and write. May. On the other hand, there are no special schools, or very, very few, for gifted children. And to pass up the gifted, on whom all our lives depend, if it weren't for intelligent people, well, read Atlas Shrugged, what would happen to us without the better minds, who are able to survive and who carry the weight of everybody else? Yet we don't spend any money on them. We do every... Well, the Hold your applause, you're gonna regret it in a moment. In 1972, Congress received the Marland Report, which gave some pretty grim opinions on the state of gifted students in America. Gifted and talented children are, in fact, deprived, and can suffer psychological damage and permanent impairment of their abilities to function well, which is equal to or greater than the similar deprivation suffered by any other population with special needs. Whether this is true or not is sort of up to interpretation, but this report, coupled with statements by people like Ayn Rand caused a lot of school districts to start creating gifted programs. By the mid-1980s, just about every school had one. In elementary school, we typically call it gifted and talented education, but in middle and high school, we call them honors classes. You guys. This became the new name for the college-bound academic track, while everyone else was labeled as mainstream, general ed, or on level. This is just a way to segregate white people in an otherwise integrated school. As we discussed earlier, among the school-aged population of the United States, white people account for 50.2%. But in public schools, they only represent 46.1%. This is due to private schools being mostly white and a few other factors we'll get to tomorrow. Here's the demographic breakdown for the 3.3 million gifted students in the United States. Again, white people make up a disproportionate amount at 58.2%. I know what you're gonna say. You earned your place in this class, either through good grades or the entrance exam. And everyone has an equal chance to get in, Right? Well, there are a number of gatekeeping methods that keep gifted and honors classes mostly white, and not all of them are overt. The entrance exam you took was at 9 a.m. on a Saturday, so not only did you have to know about the exam, but you had to provide your own transportation. You probably got a ride from your parents. What about all those families whose parents work on the weekends? A lot of you were labeled as gifted in elementary school and were simply grandfathered in, or at least have a ton of practice taking academic tests. Not every school provides those opportunities. Even if a minority student knows about the gifted and honors program and wants to take the test to get in, there are numerous ways they're pressured out of it. Those classes are pretty advanced, I wouldn't want you to fall behind. There aren't a lot of kids from your neighborhood in that class. You want to be with your friends, right? I wouldn't want you to be disappointed in yourself if you failed. But let's say they push through all of that. They take the test and they even earn a passing grade. They still might
might not get in. There are only so many seats in each class. It doesn't matter if 100 students pass the test when there are only 25 chairs. This is where parental advocacy comes into play. Those seats are going to go to the kids whose parents met with the principals and teachers, the ones who serve on the PTA and attend fundraisers. Do I need to describe these parents or have you figured it out yet? So even though none of these barriers are explicitly about race, in practice, they are. You just don't see any of that process. From your perspective, you had to wake up early on a Saturday to take a test, you passed, and now you're here. You earned this, even though it wasn't that difficult. I'm gonna level with you guys. I was in gifted and honors classes growing up, and looking back, I think that did a lot more harm than good. Not because I wasn't smart, I was very good at taking tests. But since I was taught that racism was over and everyone is equal, when I looked around the class, I was forced to draw my own conclusions to explain what I was seeing. There must be some innate difference that makes the other kids perform worse on tests. It's only now that I know the history behind standardized tests and academic tracking that I recognize that as completely false. It also really messed up my self-esteem. I was told my entire childhood that I was the cream of the crop and that I was destined to do great things. So. When that didn't happen, I started looking for explanations. I blamed things like affirmative action and feminism for holding me back. It took me decades to realize that it wasn't those outside forces. It was my honors teachers telling me how much better behaved I was than the other kids, which I now remember saying to you guys just a few days ago. Huh. But now I'm off on a tangent. The point is, everyone was finally under one school roof, though separated into different rooms. It only gets worse from here, but you'll have to wait until tomorrow to find out how. Hello everyone, and welcome to the last official day of school. Remember that our final is next Tuesday at 1.30 p.m. Bring a pencil, water, and a mask if you haven't been vaccinated. We're on a block schedule today, so we have plenty of time to finish our lesson on education. I've changed the way I'm going to test you on this. There's a link to the quiz down in the class notes below. Make sure you take that before June 16th. I won't be accepting any responses after that. To summarize what we've learned so far, we've covered the creation of public and private schools and how that dynamic has kept students racially segregated. Brown v. Board was supposed to end segregation, but didn't. We talked about how the South created segregation academies to avoid integration, and the North introduced forced busing programs, which only lasted a few years. We discussed the role of standardized testing and academic tracking as a way to continue segregation through other more scientific means, along with various attempts at creating a national curriculum. And finally, we talked about how women, ESL students, and disabled students were all brought into the classroom, and how gifted students were separated out. In 1983, the Reagan administration, advised by economist Milton Friedman, released a report called A Nation at Risk, The Imperative for Educational Reform. And it had some pretty grim things to say about our education system. If an unfriendly foreign power had attempted to impose on America the mediocre educational performance that exists today, we might well have viewed it as an act of war. As it stands, we allowed this to happen to ourselves. We have, in effect, been committing an act of unthinking unilateral educational disarmament. This was right in the middle of the Cold War. Disarmament was seen as a bad thing. It argued that academic achievement had been on a rapid decline since the launch of Sputnik, and we were quickly falling behind every other industrialized country. Declining SAT scores were the primary source for this claim. The report was widely discredited and debunked because they used the statistical method that told the story they wanted, rather than showing what was really going on. But the damage was done. People already bought it. The solution to this problem was a renewed emphasis on standardized testing. In fact, we should start testing at a much earlier age. And obviously, privatization and competition between schools would help too. This was the beginning of the school choice movement, a cause picked up by Reagan as a direct result of segregation academies being declared unconstitutional in 1976. White parents still wanted their freedom of choice plans. School choice actually began as a concept in Spanish Harlem in 1974, when they started a limited choice program within their district. If you lived in that neighborhood, you could attend any school in that neighborhood. The program was so successful at raising graduation rates that it expanded to all New York City public schools by 1992. In most places in the country, you simply go to the school which is closest to where you live. PragerU, a far-right YouTube channel masquerade 
masquerading as a university, likes to frame this as the evil government choosing your school for you. How dystopian. But in reality, it's just your geography. School choice means that you can pick any school you want, regardless of where you live. If you've been paying attention the last few days, you know where this is going. If you give people the option to self-segregate, that's exactly what they're gonna do. They won't cite race, of course. They'll talk about chaotic and disruptive classrooms, problem behavior, and low reading levels, which is just code to say what they really think. I mean, one of the problems is that many of the white kids had higher sort of academic skills. They could read better. I think, I mean, if the white kids knew how to read in first grade, and, and I guess there were black kids who also could, but it just seemed as if most of the black kids, you know, didn't really learn, learn to read. I, I just, I guess I just began to feel that things were really difficult for these kids. Schools were not made for them. That was the same lady from yesterday who believed in integration but didn't want to sacrifice her kids to it. She just said the quiet part out loud. You really should listen to the Nice White Parents podcast. It's amazing. There's a link to it down in the class notes. So what happened after New York City began school choice? Very quickly, a few high schools rose to the top and became the big three that everyone tries to get into. Stuyvesant, Brooklyn Technical, and Bronx Science. Here are the racial demographics of all New York City public schools. You'll notice that Hispanic students are the majority, and white students only make up 16.1%. That's because over half of all white students in the city attend private schools. The big three, which are specialized high schools open to the public, have a very skewed racial makeup compared to the rest of the city. White students are slightly overrepresented, but Asian students are the most obvious difference at 64%. What's going on here? In order to get into the big three, you have to take a standardized test known as the SHSAT, and even then, only one in six students will be accepted. Two thirds of New York City's students don't even bother taking this optional test. The conclusion that most people come to after seeing this data is that Asian students must possess some innate skill that makes them perform better on tests even better than white people. But the truth is much more complicated. As we've discussed before, the United States does not have a cumulative knowledge test at the end of high school. The only proof of completion you get is a diploma. A few individual states have had their own exit exams over the years, but most of them are yielding to the college aptitude tests, either the SAT or the ACT, depending on where you live. Most other countries do have a final exam. The UK has the GCSE, Germany has several of them, including the Arbiter, and China has the Gaokao. In fact, China invented the idea of standardized tests and final exams. The difference between the American SAT and the Chinese Gaokao is that if you fail the Chinese exam, you basically wasted your entire childhood. So many of these students start preparing for it a decade in advance. In many of these Asian countries, the pressure to pass these exams is so high that students have an abnormally high risk of suicide. You've probably heard about a very famous forest in Japan. It's a similar story when immigrants from those countries come to America. They hear that the SAT is our college entrance exam and they start preparing for it immediately. Parents will enroll kids in private tutoring as early as first grade. The majority of New York City's test prep centers are located in Asian communities, like China Chinatown, Flushing, and Sunset Park. They're like Starbucks, there's one on every block. So no, it's not some genetic superiority that is getting Asian students higher grades. It's entirely environmental and cultural. The more you prepare for the test, the better you will do. Black and Hispanic students are often talked out of taking the test in the same way they're discouraged from applying for gifted programs. But in this case, they get added pressure from their community too. Students who are accepted into the top schools are often bullied or shunned in their neighborhood for thinking they're too good for the school everyone else goes to. Because of school choice, New York City has the most racially segregated schools in the country. Sounds like something we should get behind doesn't it? In 1990, Milwaukee, Wisconsin began the first school choice voucher program, which is just school choice with a few extra steps. They work the same way as those Southern tuition grants from yesterday. Let's say it costs the government $10,000 per student per year to send a kid to public school. Those aren't the exact numbers, but let's keep it simple. That pays for teachers, books, facilities, everything. A school choice voucher would let you take 8,000 of that and put it towards any school you want. 
public or private. It sounds like a good idea in theory, but in practice, after a few years of the program, 75% of the school choice vouchers that were granted were spent on a school that the student was already attending. They didn't take that money and go somewhere else. So white families who were already spending close to $10,000 a year on Catholic private school now only had to pay $2,000 thanks to the program. That was how the majority of vouchers were used. If a black family wanted to get a voucher and use it on private school, they had to come up with that extra $2,000 themselves. And that's assuming the school was even accepting new students. All this accomplished was making private school cheaper for white families by shifting taxpayer funds away from public school. It didn't encourage any community integration. The mostly white Catholic schools in Milwaukee remained mostly white after the program was introduced. Yes, Wisconsin lets you use vouchers on religious schools. Currently, 14 states and the District of Columbia have introduced voucher programs for public and private schools. But in the early 90s, a third option became available. In 1992, the city of Baltimore hired Education Alternatives, Inc. to manage some of their public schools. They promised to boost test scores at the same cost or less. They hired non-union teachers, cut special education in half, eliminated art and music, and allowed corporate advertising and vending machines into the school. EAI failed to raise test scores and lost their contract. Despite this failed experiment, other corporations began to get involved in education, by capitalizing on school choice and voucher programs. They called this new arrangement a charter school. Charter schools have existed as a concept for decades, mostly as segregation academies in the South. A private school which receives public funds based on attendance. Remember? It's strange, but the more you connect the dots, the more you realize that it really always has been about race. They just slap a new coat of paint on it every few years. Instead of your freedom of choice plan giving you a tuition grant that you can use at a segregation academy, you can use a school choice voucher at a charter school. Charter schools are supposed to be open for enrollment by anyone in the community, but since there's limited space, they usually run a lottery. This sounds fair, it's technically open to everyone, but it puts minority parents in the same position as gifted and honors testing. If you don't know about it, you can't participate. Even if you do, there are dozens of ways to game the system. Maybe you have a sibling that already goes there, or your parents baked cookies for the office. Admissions requirements are kept deliberately vague for that very reason. Even if you're accepted, you might not be there for long. Charter schools suspend and expel students at triple the rate public schools do. They often just call the police for behavior issues. This takes something that would have resulted in an afternoon of detention and elevates it to a crime, ruining that kid's life. But discipline is expensive, and these schools need to make money. Corporations really got involved in the charter school business after Betsy DeVos introduced school choice to Michigan in the 90s. Ever since then, Michigan charter schools have consistently tested lower in reading and math than their public school counterparts. Charter schools are represented in dark blue here. I found this data from a YouTube video about privatization, which I'll link in the class notes. It should be noted that these standardized tests aren't the same as the college entrance exams. These are used to see how well a school is doing. This is in contrast to DC, where charter schools score about the same in reading, but quite a bit better in math. What's the difference here? DC doesn't allow corporate charter schools. If teachers and parents want to create a school that has a particular focus, like STEM or performing arts, or an entirely different system like Montessori, those schools often perform just fine. But corporate for-profit schools consistently fail. Many of them just use the same curriculum as public schools, like Core Knowledge or Common Core. They really aren't doing anything differently. They just have fewer regulations and oversight. Nationwide, charter schools have yet to catch up to public schools in any testing category. Only 17% of charter schools perform better than public schools, 46% are about the same, while 37% of them perform worse. And it's unlikely that they will ever catch up. To discuss why, we need to talk about the No Child Left Behind Act passed by George W. Bush in 2001. This law caused an exponential increase in charter schools around the country. To increase competition between schools, it tied standardized test scores to the ability of a school to remain open. How else are we supposed to determine if a school is failing? If we go by graduation rates, schools will just push students through with easy classes. It's the same story with GPA. There's no standardization. So we ended up in an era of high stakes testing. According to No Child Left Behind, if a school failed to meet their required benchmarks for five years in a row, one of three things would happen to them. First, they could turn over control of the school from the district to the state, 
Prior to this law, this was the only real remedy. The second option was to convert it to a charter school, which quickly became the most popular choice. The third option was to close the school, which was really only used if the school was already a charter. I just showed you that charter schools aren't any better at raising test scores. A quarter of them fail and close after five years, and half of them have closed since No Child Left Behind was passed. But weirdly, they all still managed to turn a profit. To see why, we need to borrow that voucher example from earlier. Let's say it costs the government $10,000 per student per year to educate someone in public school. Charter schools promise to do it for less, so they only get $8,000. By hiring non-union teachers and cutting back on programs and supplies, they might only spend $6,000 and then pocket the difference. The obvious losers in this situation are the students and the teachers. I worked at a charter school after I got my teaching degree, and my starting salary was a whopping $30,000. If I worked at a public school in the same area, I would have made $44,000. This is why PragerU has a video called Why Teachers Unions Don't Want School Choice. Not only do charter schools perform worse, but unions help make sure teachers earn a livable salary and protect them against losing their job after a school closes. And that's assuming a failing charter school was operating as intended. Many charter schools have been caught faking attendance in order to get more taxpayer money, which is exactly what happened in California in 2012. A company called K-12 paid a $168 million settlement with the state of California when it came out that they inflated attendance and test scores in order to defraud the government. Remember, charter schools receive public funds based on how many students they have enrolled. Though this was a different kind of charter school that made this scam especially easy. A kind of school that I bet most of you didn't know existed until this year. It was called an online virtual academy. This is a public charter school that operates entirely on the internet and serves every grade from kindergarten to high school. They're cheap to run because they have almost no overhead costs. I know I'm off on a tangent right now, but my first teaching job that I mentioned earlier was at a virtual academy, and I'm not saying that I personally saw them lie about attendance at my school, but I will say that I wasn't surprised to hear about this case. The way it worked at the secondary school level was that teachers would present one one-hour lecture live to students every week. Of my 350 students, I don't think I ever saw more than 50 to 100. Everyone else was able to watch it as a recording, and attendance was tracked by including a secret word somewhere in the presentation that students would enter on the website. Here's the kicker, there was only one attendance password per month, so students only had to find it once every four weeks. The rest of their coursework was exactly as you imagine, an online textbook that they would click through to get to the quiz at the end, which they could take multiple times. It's fair to say that these kids didn't retain any of that information, and that's assuming they did the coursework at all. The graduation rate at for-profit virtual schools is only 48.5%. Between 2011 and 2014, 100% of Philadelphia students attending a virtual academy failed their standardized tests. As of 2014, over a third of Philadelphia students were in virtual academies. They're sold as a sort of online assisted homeschool. Another terrible idea from the 1980s. Spearheaded by the evangelical Christian right and, of course, Reagan. In 1981, two books were published providing parents with legal resources and a curriculum outline so that they could pull their children out of public school. By 1993, homeschooling had been legalized in every state. Homeschool advocates like to cite these graphs as evidence for why homeschooling is effective. You'll see versions of them repeated everywhere. According to these, homeschooled students seem to perform better on the SAT and ACT than their traditional school counterparts. This is the sampling bias and the self-selection bias at work. Your first clue is that after they pull all of the homeschool data out, the national average is still 50s all the way across, which indicates that you're working with a very tiny sample. In any given year, fewer than 15,000 homeschool students take the SAT out of over 2 million total. It's the same story for the ACT. But remember, these tests are optional. In public school, 53% of high school students will take one of these tests before graduation. Only 10% of homeschool students do. Most don't. It might surprise you to hear this, but homeschool students do not have to take a high school equivalency test or get their GED. They can, but again, most don't. Once a parent tells the state that they're pulling their kid out for homeschool, the government is no longer involved in their education. They don't keep track of anything. The parents decide what the curriculum will be, they decide what standards need to be met, 
and they set their own graduation requirements. The state does not issue a homeschool diploma. If you want one, you have to go online to buy it or just print one out yourself. So the real question is, how many homeschool students complete any sort of high school and graduate? And the answer is that we have no idea. No state keeps track of it, and I suspect that's because homeschool advocates want to keep that information hidden. Try to look it up yourself. You won't find anything. The only data I was able to find was from Colorado, which tracks a few homeschool programs, but not your traditional idea of homeschooling. Either way, these numbers do not look very good. Nationwide, about 3% of the school-aged population is in homeschool, and this really shouldn't surprise you at this point, but white people make up a disproportionate amount. The most common reason parents give for starting homeschooling is religion, and those are just the ones who are willing to say it out loud. Who knows what school environment or dissatisfaction with academic instruction actually mean? Those sound a lot like low reading levels from before. This is a form of segregation so extreme, it's best described as isolation. Nobody is qualified to teach every subject at every grade level. I don't know why parents think they can do this job. Nobody is an expert on everything. School is supposed to be where you hear viewpoints that aren't your own and interact with people who might not look like you. Exposure breeds tolerance. Public education was created to give us a shared culture and common understanding of the world. You probably won't remember everything you learned in school. You may not remember the exact equation to determine the acceleration of a mass down a slope, but you'll at least remember that there is an equation. So when a bunch of scientists tell you that something is happening in the world and we need to make certain policy changes to prevent it, you'll understand how they came to that conclusion. Prager you would prefer that your kids not be exposed to any of that. Aside from being a fake university which has been pushing school choice for the better part of a decade, they've recently decided to start Start developing their own homeschool curriculum. I'm not kidding, they want third graders to learn about Ayn Rand and Margaret Thatcher. Recently, they've been encouraging parents to harass school administrators about curricula and ultimately pull their kids out of public school. If they're able to convince thousands or even millions of students in the next generation not to trust experts, we're never going to be rid of that backwards mindset. This is why I care so much. Why aren't you more angry about this? Wake up! Wake up! <gasps> Oh, they weren't kidding about that second shot. My whole body hurts. Oh no, this was all just a nightmare? Oh, what a lame plot device. I'm sorry guys, you'd think I'd be able to come up with something better than that. But honestly, I'm kind of glad that was a fever dream. I couldn't imagine being a teacher right now. Switching between in-person and online is a mess. People often ask me if I would ever go back to teaching and after thinking about it for a while, I'm pretty sure the answer is no. There's no way I'd be able to talk about stuff like this as a teacher. Despite what PragerU says, public schools are not leftist indoctrination centers. Anybody pushing that ideology wouldn't last very long. Most social studies teachers are centrist. That means they tend to teach how things are, rather than why things are, or how we could change them. As a YouTuber, I'm free to look into those other aspects. I'm not a public school teacher anymore. I'm not running for office, and I'm not a journalist. I'm under no obligation to appear unbiased. If I research a topic like public education and I find a common thread of racism, I'm gonna tell you about it, and I don't have to sugarcoat it to avoid getting in trouble anymore. Just to be clear, I haven't stopped teaching. I just stopped following someone else's curriculum. I've been a YouTuber for five years now. I reach way more people with a single video than I ever did in all of my years in a classroom, with the added benefit of most of you being able to vote. Public education in America has always been a battle over inclusion. Who should we allow in and what should we teach them? Students are given a different education based on who they are and what some administrator thinks they will achieve in the future. We have stratified education by race and class. And every time we try to make things more equitable, there are some people who resist. Don't let them, because now you know better. Well, this was a long one. Make sure you take the subscriber survey linked in the description below. I'd like to give a shout out to my newest Golden Fork patrons, Zion, Andrew, Jacob, Michael, Michael, and Two. If you'd like to add your name to the class roster, head on over to patreon.com slash knowingbetter, or for a one-time donation, paypal.me slash knowingbetter. Don't forget to integrate that subscribe button or the join button if you're a gifted student. Check out the merch at knowingbetter.tv, follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and join us on the subreddit.